So what we've pulled for you from the museum's collection today are a number of artifacts uh, representative of the work that women have done here at the arsenal uh, from World War I up through World War II uh, and even some, some years afterwards. Uh, so the first piece we have uh, dates back to World War I. This is a stenotype machine. This is actually used by Clara Vermeulen, uh, who's pictured here. She was, um, she was one of the new workforce that came to the arsenal in uh, 1917. Okay. So the, the women's workforce really grew during World War I kind of exponentially, uh, obviously, as, as men were drafted, went off, mm -hmm. uh, went off to serve. There was, a, there was a void, and women were called on to kind of fill that in terms of the workforce. And so uh, what she represented were it was kind of the clerical side of the work, uh, okay. which, was, which was work that was being done really um, in the years leading up to World War I and, and through World War I. Um, and so she was one of 175 clerks, stenographers that, that came here to work. So she, she would actually die of appendicitis uh, in 1918, so she didn't survive the, the entirety of the war. But what's interesting is when she came here to work at the arsenal, she actually had to provide her own stenotype machine. So she had to provide her own equipment. And so this is actually her equipment. And this, you know, this is something that, uh, especially in the World War I period here at the arsenal, was pretty common. So when women started working on assembly lines or working in the shell factory, making munitions, that sort of stuff, they were required to purchase their own uniforms. Um, and so, you know, they, you know they, they were getting these jobs, but there were also sort of these requirements that were building yeah. up over time that they were having to meet as well. Uh, one of the areas that women also worked in uh, on the arsenal, and this, this was a first during World War I, uh, was conducting various types of inspection work, uh, specifically on the Model 1903 Springfield rifle, which we produced about 113,000 of these during World War I here at the Arsenal. This was the Army's main battle rifle. So this saw use, it was adopted by the Army in 1903, saw use all the way through World War I. Um, you know, you could find instances of these being used in World War II, all the way up through, through the Vietnam War uh, in some cases. And so we, we produced a lot of these here, but women worked on the inspection lines, uh, specifically doing a process called stargate gauging, which is basically measuring uh, the rifling inside the barrels to make sure that it was meeting all of the required specifications. Uh, they actually... Very detail-oriented. Oh, very <laughs> detail-oriented. Absolutely. And What would happen if they didn't have it quite up to snuff? So just like anything uh, that we produce here at the Arsenal that doesn't, doesn't necessarily meet the minimum requirements, it's, it's scrapped and, and they send it back. So if it was not meeting the requirements, they would go, uh, they would turn it down, it wouldn't pass inspection, um, then they just keep working through. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then kind of moving forward uh, chronologically, we also have two pieces featured here. This is um, a 30 caliber, uh, 30 caliber Browning machine gun. This was produced here at Rock Island Arsenal. In fact, women um, made up the majority of the production line for this machine gun. It was actually produced down at Building 68, which is on the other end of this row of stone shops. Uh, it's where First Army is headquartered today. Okay. Uh, so women were working on this. You'll get, uh, you'll get to see some of the images of these a little later when, when you're going through the archives. Uh, so women were working on all of the milling, um, the production of basically every component for this mach machine gun. And during World War II, we produced 85,000 of these, uh, and wow. women were a major part of that production. And then we also have a barrel. So this is actually the barrel that's inside this, uh, this jacket here. Okay. Uh, we produced these here at the arsenal as well, and women did a lot of the broaching, which is the, the term for rifling, basically, okay. the barrel. Okay. And so they were running all of those machines. Uh -huh. uh, during World War during World War II, by about 1945, women comprised about 38% of the workforce here. Uh, there are some departments, especially, especially our shipping and receiving departments here, where women comprised up to 65, 70%. Of, of the workforce in those specific departments. And prior to the World Wars, it was... Oh, you're talking, zero. yeah, you're talking, you're talking not necessarily near zero. They were doing a lot of the, uh, a lot of the office type work and support, secretarial, clerical, that sort of work. Um, but yeah, you're talking 10, 15% of the workforce uh, up to, you know, almost, almost 5,000 women working here by 1945 wow. uh, across the arsenal. So and pretty what incredible. what percentage would that be about? Uh, so that was about 38% of the okay. workforce here. So you had about 5,000 women working here and about 8,000 men working here. Okay. That kind of, kind of breaks down. Uh, another area where women were, uh, were employed was for the production of metallic belt links. So, um, you know, it's a pretty, pretty small, really throwaway kind of piece. But what these do is they link together ammunition that are used in things like 
machine All the guns. Very exactly. <laughs> exactly. And we made we made these in the millions here at Rock Island Arsenal. Uh, we also exported some of the expertise to other places that, that would end up producing these belt links. And then one of the really cool pieces we have in our collection, um, this is actually a micrometer tool, so it's for measuring um, thickness. And, and this was used by a woman named Ethel Boston, who worked in this department working on these metallic belt links. So what's really cool is her name's actually etched on oh, there. Wow. Yeah, so we know. So you absolutely know it's Yeah, we oh, absolutely know it's hers. Yeah, like, how do you know? <laughs> what do you? Yeah, so she, she actually. Your numbers to go. Yeah, right. <laughs> so she actually, <laughs> she actually. The other name? Uh, Ethel Boston. I can see it on here. Yeah, absolutely. Can you get that? I know the lighting can be a little funky in here. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so again, she was, she was doing that sort of inspection work. Uh, again, really important work when you talk about quality control, you know, everything getting shipped out of here. You know, if it's Stamped Rock Island, which, um, you know, this, this pack of everything out of here comes with a RIA on it. There you go. And, and so it really is indicative of sort of the, the quality. Wow. Yeah. And then the last group of, grouping of artifacts we have here um, are uniform pieces that belong to uh, Ruth Miller. Uh, Ruth Miller actually worked here at the Arsenal during the war. So she worked here from um, actually before the war when we were starting to supply our allies, 1940s. Uh, and then she, along with about 49 other women workers here at the Arsenal, would go on to join the military mm. during the war. So she would actually join the Women's uh, Army Corps, the WACs, during, uh, I think it was 1944 she joined. She would end up being assigned to Chanute Airfield, which is about south of Chicago. Okay. Uh, it's Chanute Air Force Base now near uh, Rantoul. And so she would actually serve through the, through the end of the war, about six months after, um, in her capacity as a, as a WAC. And like I said, about 49 other women would end up joining as well, uh, whether it was the Women's Army Corps, the Waves, which was the Navy equivalent, or the SPARS, which was the, the Coast Guard equivalent, um, and serving in those different capacities. So we kind of have kind of a dual service in, in, a, in a respect. You have them working here at the arsenal, producing things like, like that. Uh, and then you also have them actually joining the military. And so we have you know, her jacket with her service ribbon, discharge patch. Um, this is actually an army issue purse, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, and then army issue gloves, shoes, uh, skirt, uh, and the other components of her uniform. And then, like I said, she was actually assigned to an, an airfield. And so she actually has um, a US Army um, Air Corps patch on her jacket. That's, so. a, that's a lot of ways that women have definitely had their hand in uh, in the wars and, and just in the military in general. Talk yeah. about uh, this, the significance and the impact. I, I, I know you've seen the, the individual items, but yeah. how impactful was it for, for women to be involved in these things? Yeah, so, so it was impactful on a, on a number of different levels. So, you know, let's talk World War I. So women during World War I, a lot of the time, it was the first time they were they're having a job outside of the home. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of the time you see a rise of something that we take for granted today, but that's largely independent women. So getting jobs, making money, living on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, really, it was, it was their ability to come and work at a place like the Arsenal that really allowed them to do that sort of thing. Uh, World War II was no different. Uh, what you do see during World War II, though, is a, is a major shift in the kind of work women are doing. So they're coming into the workforce here at the Arsenal, and instead of working clerical positions or things like that, they're, um, you know, they're taking on leadership positions at the Arsenal. They're, they're doing manufacturing work that up until that point was largely considered men's work here at the Arsenal. And so, you know, you're almost breaking a glass ceiling in a way. And, you know, I will, I will stop short of saying that the arsenal was, you know, breaking, mm -hmm. breaking those barriers, but we were really right there at the forefront along with a lot of American industry, along with um, a lot of army, army manufacturing, the army organic industrial base in, in moving women forward within the workforce. So in those ways, it was, it was incredibly impactful. Now, unfortunately, you know, we have these major strides during World War I, we have these major strides during World War II, and then in the post-war period, you always have, you know, you have an almost return to the status quo. Um, but I would say certainly you saw that a lot during World War I, maybe World War II, less of that. Obviously, the, the female workforce here on the arsenal reduced greatly uh, following both of those conflicts. But during World War II, there was certainly, uh, or in the years following World War II, you know, women were hired, certainly more in those, in those quote unquote, man's positions in the manufacturing pieces. Wow. And so looking at, you know, you'd mentioned, I think, 
uh, was it World War II, we had about 37, 38 percent mm-hmm. of the workforce on the arsenal was women. Yeah. What does that look like today? Uh, so so the arsenal, uh, and I haven't seen the exact numbers anytime uh, recently, Guesstimate. but yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> um, so so the workforce here is is really representative of the larger federal workforce, mm-hmm. which is about 50-50. Okay. Uh, so so that's really where the, the larger federal workforce, that's Department of Defense, you know, every government agency you can think of um, is about 50-50. And, and here we're, we're also representative yep. of that. So yeah, you have that, you definitely have equality there, yep. uh, at least in, in, in those senses. Um, and so yeah, it's, it, it has certainly shifted as, as time has gone on.